We're coming to you live from Purdue University with our Disease Detective Zip Trip. Now, we made the show with seventh graders in mind. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Jackson, your Purdue Zip Trip Guide. Now, this is our first ever pilot presentation of the show, and we have four different pilot schools watching today. And here in our studio on the Purdue campus, we have students joining us from Tecumseh Junior High School. Hi, guys. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Can you wave hi to hi. everyone who's watching? Hey. Hey, hey. <laughs> also, if any of you out there have any questions for our scientists, you can email them right to the show at ziptrips at purdue.edu. So, today's zip trip is called Disease Detectives. Why are we calling it that? Well, because a disease is like a suspect scientists are trying to identify. Today, we're going to meet three different scientists doing disease work. Have you ever heard of or actually seen a pig with a cold? Well, today you will. Believe it or not, pigs can get sick just like you and me. A Purdue veterinarian will join us to talk to us more about this. Also, is there such thing as a doggy dentist? Well, we'll see this dog, Gidget, have her teeth cleaned live right here on our show. And we'll find out how Purdue scientists are studying dogs' mouths to learn more about disease. Finally, this is your chance to be a disease detective. So get ready to look for clues and solve a mysterious case about infectious disease with Purdue entomology experts. We'll have all this and more, so get ready to have some fun and learn something too. How'd you like track? It's fun. Uh, I ran like two miles. <laughs> well, I gotta get going. See you around. All right. needs to quit spreading his germs and needs to stay at home. What do you guys think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay, earlier today we said we're going to learn about disease. Now, many diseases are caused by germs, which are microorganisms that can spread from person to person. Scientists have studied the spread of disease for hundreds of years. Did you know that a long time ago we didn't even know that germs existed? Did you guys know that? No, I didn't either. Well, let's take a quick look back at the history of disease with a scientist you may have heard of. Hello, everyone. I am Louis Pasteur. You may know me as the inventor of pasteurization. Come back in time with me, won't you? Hundreds of years ago, infectious diseases like the Black Plague, smallpox, and yellow fever spread all over the world. Infectious diseases are caused by little tiny organisms called pathogens. Back in the day, there was no cure, and diseases were deadly. But since then, thanks to scientists, things are much better. 
Because of Joseph Lister, doctors now thoroughly wash their hands before surgery, sanitize surgical instruments, and keep wounds clean to prevent infection. Scientists have also developed vaccinations, the shots you get at the doctor, to help your immune system fight the disease. Diseases can also be spread from bacteria in your food. That's why I came up with pasteurization, to use heat to kill harmful microorganisms in your milk. Scientists are always studying and learning more about disease. Like right now, they are learning about conditions like heart disease, cancer, and HIV. Thanks to the continuing work of scientists like me, we've come a long way. Well, as you just saw in the video, disease is pretty serious stuff and can make humans and other animals really sick. Scientists do some really important work to try to help us and improve our lives. Joining us here in the studio are two of our disease detectives, Dr. Sandy Amos and registered vet technician Jessica Schneider. Hey guys. Hi. Can you wave to our kids at uh, Tecumseh Junior High? Hey guys. Hi. <laughs> Tecumseh, Sandy and Jessica. <laughs> Sandy and Jessica, Tecumseh. <laughs> All right, so tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Sandy. Well, I'm a swine veterinarian, and this time of year, pigs get the flu just like people do. Really interesting, and Jessica? And well, it's my job to help veterinarians like Sandy, um, just like a nurse would help a doctor. Got it. Now you mentioned flu season, yes. right? Okay, I've heard about something called that H1N1 virus, have you guys heard of that? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so can you tell us about it? Being a pig veterinarian, do you study that? Well, I don't study that because the new H1N1 virus is a people disease, not a pig disease. But if sick people go on to the farms, they can make the pigs sick. So my job as a veterinarian is to make sure that sick people stay away from my healthy pigs. Got it. So I guess there's a misconception out there because I thought that the H1N1 had to do with pigs. but. In fact, it's the opposite. Humans are the ones who can give it to pigs, correct? Yeah, that's correct. But pigs can get other types of flu. Have you ever had a cough or a fever? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I have. <laughs> well, when pigs get sick, they get coughs and fevers just like people do. Uh, let's take a look at this video. Okay, let's look at it. They'll uh, lay around. This is a pig with a cough. Aww. Aww. Poor little piggy. And they can also get runny noses and they get worn out and like to rest just like we do. And when the pigs get sick, the farmer calls the veterinarian just like your mom would call the doctor when you're sick. Right. And then we would go out to the farm, but before we go out to the farm, we have to put on clean outerwear so we don't bring any germs that might make the pigs sick. Oh, so what does that look like? We have some right over really? here. Let's take a look. We have our helpers. The first thing that we put on is overalls. Overalls. And it's a big white clean suit. It'll make you look like a marshmallow person. Cool. I'm all about this. <laughs> oh, wow. This should be interesting. Okay, and then we what have else do you have? Boots. Okay. And then we have gloves next. Well, okay, gloves and? And the last thing we put on is a mask, so if we cough, we don't spray germs onto the pigs. Oh, very interesting. So can I put this stuff on? Sure. And some of the kids as well? Sure, sure. that'd be great. Okay. And while you're putting that on, let's take a look at a farm call we went to. Okay, let's go. farm and we've been called out to see some sick pigs. I'm Travis and I'm the manager of the farm and I had to call the veterinarians because I think our pigs have flu. So what we're going to do is go onto the farm and go through the building and look at the pigs and see if there are any um, indications that these pigs might be sick. When we go in there we'll be looking at everything from their temperature to see if they have a runny nose, if they're cold and shivering. And now I'm going to take the temperature of the pig to see if it's within normal range. This is 101.1 which is normal. We just finished looking at the younger pigs and now we come down to the older pigs to see if they have any symptoms. and sneezing in this barn. Not excessive coughing and sneezing, but a little bit. 
there's not enough sneezing or coughing to make me think that the veterinarian needs to come in and really observe this room to see what it is. We finish up the visit, we observe the pigs, we'll let the lab get our results back to us, but we think we have some good news for the farmer. We think he has some pretty healthy animals here and does not have flu. Well, we are all suited up and ready to go. We've got our clean suits on so that we are not spreading any germs to any of these humans. And if we were so on a farm, we wouldn't be spreading germs to pigs, right? Right. right. Okay. So what do you think about those suits? What do you guys think? I feel, like like a day? <laughs> I feel like a marshmallow woman. Can you dance in them? Like Should the robot? Sorry, I just that Well, I particularly hate getting sick. You guys hate getting sick? Yeah. What do you yeah. guys do to make yourselves feel better when you're feeling ill or under the weather? Yeah. I usually go like rest on my bed. You do? Okay. And what about you? I lay down and I eat something cold. That's a good idea. When I'm sick, I typically lie down in my bed as well and drink a lot of orange juice. What do pigs do? Well, it's kind of the same thing when pigs are sick. They don't get orange juice, of course, but they like to rest and we give them plenty of fresh water and in a few days they feel fine. They're ready to go. Pigs Good. also get vaccinated to prevent the flu just like people do. Vaccinations, mm, so that means shots, right? Right. Oh, I'm not a big fan of that. How about you guys? <laughs> no, no. Not so much. Well, do you guys have any questions for Sandy or Jessica? Yes. What do you guys like about your job? Great question. What do you guys like about your job? I like everything about my job. <laughs> I love working with people and teaching students and helping people keep their animals healthy. And what about you, Jessica? I like the variety that it brings with animals and humans. Got it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We've had a lot of fun in our clean <laughs> suits, <laughs> in our marshmallow suits. And remember, if you, any of you, yes, I'm talking to you out there, think of any more questions, remember, you can email them to ziptrips at purdue.edu. So just like the scientists on our show, I'm going to play disease detective and figure out where germs live. So I'm going to take this swab and this Petri dish and test all of the hot spots in our building. Let's do that. Put it here. Now let's see what happens. And let's check out this bathroom handle to see what kind of yucky germs are on there. It's probably disgusting. We'll check on these petri dishes later on in the show to see what type of bacteria grew. Well, believe it or not, germs live right inside our bodies. Some of the most serious diseases can be caused by germs that you're already carrying around with you. That's right. And guess where they are? They're in your mouth. And that's why we go to the dentist to get our teeth cleaned. Do you like going to the dentist? Well, we're about to learn why not so fun dentist checkups and having clean teeth are very important. And remember, if any of you think of any questions during this segment, email them into us, ziptrips at purdue.edu. So, just like humans, animals need good dental care and teeth cleaning too. Not only does it keep your dog from having stinky bad breath, but it can also keep him healthy. 
Joining us live from the vet school here at Purdue University is wellness veterinarian, Dr. Steve Thompson. Hi, Dr. Thompson. Hello, Jessica. Good morning. How are you? I am doing well. And where are you exactly? Well, we are still on Purdue's campus, but we have moved. Uh, we are in the veterinary teaching hospital. Okay. And we specifically are on the small animal side or the pet side. And this is the dental room with me is Heather White. She is a registered veterinary technician. Hi Heather. Um, she is involved, she's our head uh, dental technician and works in the surgery department as well. Okay. We also have Erin Near. She Hi. is a registered veterinary technician in our anesthesia group and her job is to help keep our patient which is Gidget. Gidget is a four-year-old female Jack Russell Terrier, very much alive, but under <laughs> anesthesia here okay. today. So basically, Gidget's just taking a nap right now, right, Dr. Thompson? That's correct, and in just a few moments, we will actually begin cleaning her teeth. Uh, you'll notice a few similarities um, compared to the video you saw where the child went to the human dentist. Uh, in this room, we have similar instruments, what we call hand scalers, to help remove the plaque and tartar buildup that's on the teeth. We have a similar dental type x-ray unit uh, where we can take x-rays and now uh, like the computer screen behind us we ha can get uh, the x-rays actually digitally. Um, there are obviously some differences. Mm -hmm. um, our patient is under anesthesia. We have um, some blankets to help keep Gidget quite warm underneath. She actually has a warm water um, heating pad to help keep her warm. Um, there is a tube that is carrying the oxygen into her mouth and she won't be talking to us. We don't have to have a conversation during the procedure. Um, when the actual cleaning starts, the gum can be painful. Sometimes kids will grab onto the chair when right. the dental hygienist is doing that part. Um, and so that's the main reason for us to effectively clean her teeth. Uh, she has to be quite relaxed. Got it. So we know it's important to go to the dentist so that we won't get cavities, but we're starting to think that there's something more to it than just getting cavities, right? Uh, that's correct. There is a link between gum disease because it has, the gum has to function to keep all that bacteria in the mouth out, and if they get into the bloodstream, they can have systemic effects on the body. We're going to get started here um, on the actual teeth cleaning. So as we do that, um, I'm going to be putting on a mask that's going to be important um, because we will have bacteria from Gidget's mouth potentially in the air. The cameraman here are also um, putting on their masks uh, really? as well as um, Aaron. Um, so you'll notice that Heather, because she is directly there as we start the cleaning, has also put on um, some goggles. Um, we just had talked about um, the concern with the gums and having infection. Um, and if there's really, really bad teeth um, and that allows bacteria to get through that gum barrier and once it gets into the bloodstream, um, it can go through the bloodstream and have problems on the lungs, cause some scarring. Eventually, it can actually get to the kidneys where they're trying to filter out the badness of, in the bloodstream. Um, and that can cause the kidneys to also scar down and eventually become um, too small and that can even contribute to uh, kidney failure. Interesting. You know, I just didn't know how important it really is to have clean teeth. Did you guys know that? It can cause kidney disease and all of that stuff? I didn't know that. And so this is important for humans and animals as well, right, Dr. Thompson? That's correct. Prior to 1999, kidney disease was the leading cause of death in both dogs and cats. Um, and since that time, um, we've actually had improvements in um, dental care starting in the 90s. Um, improved dental care of both dogs and cats. That allowed us to have less um, kidney disease to where um, now dogs and cats are living much, much longer than they used to. That's great that they're living longer. Now, maybe it's just me, but I, I always thought that dogs had cleaner mouths than humans. Is that true or is that a myth? Um, there is, that is a myth. So there was a study that looks at the diversity, the actual numbers of bacteria that are in the mouth uh -huh. of a dog and a cat. And what happens, uh, or what that study showed is that if you culture different types of bacteria, and that would relate to things like 
strep, which students have probably heard of strep throat. Right. If we look at um, Pasteurella, named after um, Louis Pasteur, E. coli, those are all different types of bacteria. And if you compare a human mouth, there's lots more species of bacteria than if you compare studies culturing a dog's mouth. Now, there's still lots of bacteria in both mouths, but that's where that myth comes from. Right. Well, can you give us a play-by-play -play of the teeth cleaning of Gidget right now, yes. Dr. Thompson? Yes. So the sound you hear, so another difference that's more common in veterinary medicine is the use of an ultrasonic scaler. Mm -hmm. So you'll see there's a water spray, and what that allows us to do is actually clean the mouth faster. In people, it's a little messier because of the water spray, but this ultrasonic scaler will get hot um, during the, the cleaning. So you'll see that um, Heather will be on um, one tooth for no more than a second or two, and then she'll move, and if there's a lot of buildup on the tooth, she has to go back um, to get that tooth um, cleaner. The water spray then helps to keep things um, cool so that it doesn't burn the enamel, and the tube that she has in will um, keep her from swallowing any of that extra water, which is really important. And people, you have to constantly stop, have people kind of spit or choke um, or swallow that um, extra uh, water or saliva. In our patients, we can just keep going our table here and the, the towels can actually handle the extra water. Good. She's got enough teeth clean. I'm going to have her pause for a second and actually show kind of the polishing part. So she's got one or two teeth. It's very important after a tooth is cleaned um, because it does create a little, um, when we're removing, scaling off the plaque, it can create micro grooves in uh, the surface of the enamel. So she's using actually a cherry flavored polish. Cherry um, flavored. <laughs> that uh, will help um, smooth out the surface then of uh, these couple teeth that she's got clean so far. So it kind of is like when we go to the dentist. Yes. The uh, with the options of cherry flavor, do they like mint flavor? Mint tends to be a little too strong, too much of a kick um, uh, okay. for our patients. Now the next step is where we actually will use a probe, and I'm going to have um, Heather also pause here for a moment. And when the teeth are fully cleaned, after the hygienist has cleaned any of the student's teeth, They'll actually, what I'm going to do is come in and we're going to look and there are some black and silver lines on here. They're about three millimeters each, the silver lines and the black lines. And I can go along the gum line and mostly what I'm looking for is any evidence of periodontal disease where the gums have been too damaged. Right. Now she has a little bit of bleeding, but the gingivitis and wait, yeah, so, um, is not that bad on these teeth. So right now, since she's only four, this is uh, more of in a prevention mode of, of her teeth cleaning. Right. I'm going to let Heather continue where she left off. Now, now, when Gidget wakes up, how does she wake up and how long does it take her to wake well, up? Well, earlier this morning, she received a minor tranquilizer to relax her, allows to get an IV catheter in, mm -hmm. and that tranquilizer will wear off a little longer than the gas. So when we turn the gas off, she'll still get oxygen. She'll wake up in just a few minutes, but she doesn't She's not fully aware. I can't tell her, Gidget, you're going to fall asleep and when you're going to wake up in a strange place. And right. um, even though it's kind of like doggy camp here when they, they visit us, <laughs> but um, she will still be able to go home um, about mid-afternoon. She'll be fully awake in just uh, probably half an hour uh, when we're done and um, she'll be able to go home in a couple hours. Good. Well, this whole experience, it really is just like when we go to the dentist and the reasons are just as important for dogs as they are for humans, right, Dr. Thompson? That's correct. Well, we do have, it looks like we just got an email question in for you, and this is from Rossville Middle School. The question for you, Dr. Thompson, is what do you use to brush animals' teeth? That's a fantastic question because the human toothpastes are a problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's two things in our human toothpaste that are a concern. Number one is the foaming agent that helps spread out um, the toothpaste in our mouth causes nausea, so it's important oh. that we should spit out that toothpaste if we swallow it. Our pets don't usually have that. Um, we can't tell them spit out the toothpaste. Number two is too much fluoride, especially when the pets are swallowing human toothpaste can cause toxicity. So the pet toothpaste don't have that. Got so it. because there's a special toothpaste, those are flavored. So although we don't use cherry, there is fish flavored for cats. Really? There is poultry flavored, malt flavored, and vanilla. 
for dogs. Oh, yummy. And um, <laughs> that does make it um, more fun. And again, there's not the fluoride added because there could be some toxicity, especially in cats and small dogs. Good. So it's not that bad for the dogs. Then they kind of probably like the taste of it, of Correct. The, tooth, the pet toothpaste. So. And, and if they get them brushed regularly, hopefully we can space out the anesthetic needs and not have to do quite as many teeth cleanings, although we brush and floss and still have to get our teeth cleaned. So brushing won't eliminate the need for a professional cleaning. Absolutely. Well, do you guys in our studio audience have any questions for Dr. Thompson? You again? Okay. What is your question? How long have you been working there? The question for you, Dr. Thompson, is how long have you been working at Purdue? Well, I have been a veterinarian now for 20 years. This is my 13th year here doing dentistry here at Purdue. Wow, so a long time. All right, well, remember, you can email in your questions to ziptrips at purdue.edu. Thanks so much, Dr. Thompson. This has been amazing and an eye-opening experience. Great. See you later. Yes. <laughs>
a couple of days after, uh, next day after one of these walks, uh, the walk that I got the red rash, right. I noticed a sort of a freckle-like mark on my arm. And I looked at it closely and actually it was sort of a light pinkish freckle. Really? And so then I started to poke at it a bit and noticed that it was some tiny bug that was attached and Ew. was sucking my blood. Oh! And so I just carefully removed it. <laughs> You and removed it. being interested in what it was, <laughs> I put it in an alcohol vial, and Jeff's a really good at bug identification, so he's going to take a shot okay, at this. Okay, Detective Let's take a look at Jeff. This, Jessica. Let's see. What yeah. you got for us here, John? Oh, oh, I see it. It does look like a little freckle. Wow, John, that's about a point tip of a pencil right there. And you know what, John? It's definitely not a mosquito. No. But no. you know what? It's actually a tick. Really? And absolutely. And ticks actually have... Uh, there's many species out there, but this one in particular is the uh, black-legged tick or the deer tick. The deer tick. Interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. So that bite mark then mm -hmm. was from that little freckle-sized tick. Right. And okay. another thing to point out as well is that the deer tick is uh, the main primary vector, the transferring agent of uh, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Lyme disease? Mm -hmm. So, okay, what is Lyme disease? Well, Lyme disease is actually caused by a Borrelia, or Borrelia burgdorferi. I know it's a tongue twister. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a spiral-shaped bacteria, as you can see right here. It's actually about a million times some time smaller than this, actually. But it actually, through the tick bite, it will enter into your skin, uh -huh. go in through that bite into your blood, eventually go into your heart, your joints, uh, your deep tissues and everything, systemic infections we call it, and it'll cause you problems throughout your life oh, unless you get no. treated for it. So. so the key word was treated there, I heard mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. John, did you get treated for it? Well, yeah, when I saw that red rash, it got my attention, and um, so I went to a doctor uh -huh. and showed the doctor um, the red rash, okay. and then she um, asked me some questions about some of my recent activities. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned the walk in the woods, I mentioned getting the bugs on me, Right. I mentioned pulling a tiny tick off myself. And then it's interesting, she sort of relaxed. She had the diagnosis, and yeah. then she said I had Lyme disease, prescribed antibiotics, and then I started taking the pills, and the rash disappeared in about, oh, four or five days. Good, so in this case, the doctor helped you reach a conclusion by analyzing the evidence that right. was presented to her and prescribing a treatment. Yes. So, Jeff. Yeah. Case is solved. <coughs> awesome. Awesome. Tell me Good a little job. bit about this tick. <laughs> How does a tick attach itself to a human? That is a great question, Jessica. And actually, John's going to help me out here. Okay. What um, do you uh -oh. <laughs> uh, Watch okay. out. Okay. <laughs> That's kind of intimidating. All right. So, so tell us. The tick has basically two types, uh, two parts to its mouth. Uh -huh. uh, the first is the cutting part, which is kind of like our, our mouth, our teeth. Uh -huh. We use to cut skin. And then our second part. Thank you, Careful John. of that one. Yes. <laughs> Watch out. It's kind of like a saw-like tongue. It'll yeah. stick into the skin, basically, and it has serrar serrated edges, so it can't pull out. And it'll secrete a glue-like substance around the bite mark, uh. so it actually helps the tick stay within your skin. Oh, that's feed, horrible. So. What a horrible feeling. Well, can you show us what uh, we can do to prevent ourselves from getting um, bitten by a tick? Come on. <laughs> Okay, all right, so this is your outfit. This is your getup. Is this the new style or something, or, or what? We What's just going started on here? the style. <laughs> they're they're la laughing, they're at, laughing at me. <laughs> How come you're laughing at me? All right, so tell us, why are you dressed like this? Like a nerd. Okay, a nerd. Yeah, a nerd. I think it's kind of cool. A I might, I might yeah. try it. Um, well, when I go in the woods, if I'm thinking carefully, I always tuck my pants into socks uh -huh. to protect myself so the ticks don't get directly on my body. Okay, so can I try it? Sure. Okay, cool. Tucking Let's your pant see. legs is definitely good as well, but you know, you want to tuck in you your shirt like as well. You guys like my socks, don't you? Yeah, we're jealous. All right, <laughs> cool. So now I won't, I can Stylish. prevent myself from, from any tick bites or, or insect bites, right? Cool. Yeah, well. I'm ready for my walk in the woods. Walk in the woods. <laughs> Mosquitoes can still get you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, remember, you guys out there can email in your questions to ziptrips at purdue.edu. Do you guys have any questions for John or Jeff right now? Anything about insects? Yes. Did it hurt when you get bit? Ah, uh, that's Did a it great hurt question. When you got bit. I asked her to give me an easy question before we came out here, and she uh -huh. gives me a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I didn't feel it at all, and that's one of the things that's that's 
mm, a little bit dangerous about these ticks is that you typically don't feel them. So you have, right. to, you have to check yourself very, very carefully when you come back from a walk in the woods Good. to make sure you don't have ticks on your body. Okay, yeah. well you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Jeff and John, John are entomologist experts. It's been a pleasure. Yep, thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you. Well, today we have looked at the history of disease and learned about some current disease issues. And now, can you imagine some of the ways we will fight off disease here in the future? Well, here at Purdue, there are scientists working on what's called nanomedicine. So take a look at this. Hi, I'm Jim Leary. I'm a professor at Purdue University. And we're now in the Burke Nanotechnology Center. And what I'm going to talk to you about and show you as a tour of my labs is the use of nanotechnology combining with medicine in a new discipline known as nanomedicine. And this is a revolutionary new way to approach solving human disease one cell at a time, and hopefully long before any of the destructive stages of disease begin. So let's go for a tour of my laboratory, and we'll look and see what this really means. Let's stop at my lab here. This is where we're making a portable blood analyzer device that's about the size of a cell phone. And we're gonna be using this to uh, give to astronauts to take up on the space shuttle and space station. And we're also going to bring it into operating rooms with newborn babies are born so we can analyze their blood and try to see if there's any uh, treatment that the babies need immediately after birth. Inside the room, you'll see my student looking at some of the little microchips. And again, these things are about the size of a microscope slide, and they're going to go inside this device. Let's take a tour of the, of the clean room. We can't go inside the clean room because even something as small as a speck of dust is like a boulder to the people who work inside that facility, and much too big for anything that we also work on on the devices uh, that we're making for nanomedicine. So we have to keep very, very clean, but we do have a viewing gallery that we can actually go by and look through and see people as they work in this facility. This room, we use light beams to actually make little channels smaller than the width of a human hair that can allow the blood cells to go down those channels and then be counted properly and analyzed for blood analyzer. The windows here are orange covered because we have to get out all of the stray light that would otherwise destroy the process of making those very, very fine channels. Let's go inside my lab and I'll show you some really cool technology where we're using laser beams to look at cells streaming past at more than 50,000 cells per second. And we, we're going to be using this to look at very, very rare cancer cells that are inside blood. The machine I'm going to show you is a flow cytometer cell sorter. And basically this is a machine that's kind of like a microscope except instead of putting cells on a slide we actually shoot them past a laser beam at very, very high speeds. And we can look at them one at a time. And that's very important because when we do nanomedicine, we're actually trying to do single cell medicine. So to do that with the trillions of cells that you have in your body, we have to examine them very, very fast if we're going to find, for example, cancer cells circulating around inside uh, a person's body. So let's go inside and see 
what my graduate student Mike Zordon is doing. One of the things we're doing with Mike's research is we're finding those very rare cancer cells and we're finding how to target our little nano devices to those, those rare cells. And that will allow us to be able to put very, very tiny medicines inside the human body to go around the human body and find those very rare cells and cure them at a very early age. So instead of taking one pill in the morning uh, for like you do your vitamin pill, we would have put in billions of little tiny pills that would then circulate around the body and find the cancer cells and search and destroy those in ways so that people don't have to undergo the very painful uh, chemotherapy that you, many of you may know from members in your family and friends. So this will allow us to treat the disease at a very early stage and to have a very high success level in being able to cure cancer and other diseases. Wow, a trip to the doctor will be so much different in the future. So remember when I played detective earlier in the show? What do you think the Petri dishes detected from the bathroom and from the bathroom door handle and the elevator push button. Well, let's take a look. Ew! What do you guys think about that? Disgusting. Kind of disgusting, <laughs> right? <laughs> it looks like some bacteria formed there. And you know what? Just a reminder to all of you guys and all of you who are watching, um, wash your hands, okay? Remember that. All right, well, we do have a little bit of time left in the show, so let's take some questions for our disease detectives. We've got some email questions that came in. Uh, the first one is for John and Jeff, our entomologist experts. Uh, this is from Rossville Middle School. What kind of tools do you use mm. to study ticks? Oh, mm. you go ahead with that. Okay. Well, at first, you know, to collect ticks, we actually use just a regular one meter squared corduroy cloth to go out and sample the forest floors a lot of times. Okay. And at the same time, you can use mammal traps to trap mammals and actually examine the mammals for looking or for ticks attached to them. And from this, we're able to get a pretty good field sample of ticks in the area. So, so. tools are very important Absolutely. for your job. Mm -hmm. All right. And the next question comes from Benton. Central. This is for Dr. Thompson. Uh, do you use the same tools for dogs as you use when humans go to the dentist? Yes, the instruments, uh, the hand scalers um, that we use are the, the same ones. There are some specialized instruments when we do dentistry on rodents, so mm -hmm. on rabbits and guinea pigs. Um, they have an even smaller mouth and there are some special instruments that help us work uh, with those species. Right. Okay. And this question is another question from Rossville Middle School. This is for Sandy and Jessica, our pig veterinarian experts. Um, aside from vaccines, do pigs receive medication for symptoms like Tylenol or Advil? Well, pigs only get medications if they're actually sick, if we're okay. sure that we have a disease. Okay, and we also have another email question. <clears throat> this is from Rossville Middle School again. Mm -hmm. They are paying attention today, <laughs> I love it. All right, this is for Jeff and John. What is your favorite insect? I'll start with you, John. Yeah, John. Oh. What's your favorite insect <laughs> of all of the ones you study? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, okay, and what about you, Jeff? I would have to say either a spider or a tick just because they're so efficient in what they do in life. Okay, they're good, hard, diligent <laughs> workers, aren't <Yeah>. they? <laughs> All right, and we have one more question from Rossville Middle School for Sandy and Jess. Wow. Why is a pig's temperature so much higher than a human's? That's a very good question, and most animals have a temperature that's just a couple degrees higher than people. Interesting, okay. Well, you know what? It's that time. I want to thank all of our <laughs> lovely guests for joining us, as well as our students in the studio. And for those who are watching, I'm Jessica Jackson for Purdue Zip Trips. See you guys next time. Let's wave bye. Bye. See you.